Greetings, founders. Welcome to Feel the Boot, the science of startups. I'm your host, Lance Cottrell, and I'm here to help you navigate the nearly vertical learning curve that you're going to encounter as an early stage founder. I know what it's like. I've been there myself. I started my own company and I've seen many other founders go through this in their journey as both an angel investor and an advisor. In this episode, I want to help you think through the decision of whether to bootstrap your company or go for outside funding from angels or venture capital. There are fundamentally two paths to growing your business. First, you can bootstrap it using your own revenues to grow, or you can bring in outside money and accelerate the process. And it's not a totally black or white choice, although once you bring in venture capitalists, you really have made a commitment to that kind of growth path. So the first question you need to ask yourself is whether you are even a candidate for taking venture capital investment, because most companies aren't in fact a good fit for VCs. To make their funds work, they have to have exits that are in the billions to tens of billions of dollars and in a reasonably short time frame, so their investors get a payback. So you need to be able to take huge amounts of money, deploy it effectively, and grow like crazy to these stellar valuations, be able to take over a really big marketplace. Now, if that's you, VC may be an option, although it still might not be the right choice. If that's not what your company looks like, you can stop watching now and just focus on bootstrapping because VC's not going to be a choice for you. To my mind, there's really two situations in which VC is obviously the right way to go. And the first is where whatever you're doing is clearly a winner-take-all market. There's only going to be one company sitting on top of the mountain at the end of the day and fundamentally no one even close. Right? If there are any other players, they're going to be teeny niche players in, in the corners. So certain kinds of social media are like that. Right? There aren't five companies just like Facebook. There are several social media companies, but each one is sort of dominating a very different kind of social media environment. But in each one, there is only one player. The other case in which VC is clearly the right answer is when it takes a huge amount of capital to be successful in the marketplace. You need to be buying lots of huge factories or deploying mega amounts of infrastructure and it simply will take that kind of cash before you're going to be able to reach any kind of profitability. And so bootstrapping in those scenarios really isn't an option. On the flip side, when is bootstrapping clearly the right answer? To me, it's really when you can't effectively deploy large quantities of money. If I were to write a $10 million check to your startup and say, here, how can you spend this to start generating revenues right away? If you don't have a good answer to that, something that's going to create a scalable, effective company, then you shouldn't be taking big wads of money. And that's also why typically you wouldn't be offered it. They, VCs don't like to invest until they see some kind of really good product market fit and know that they've got a cash making machine that if they cut you this check, you can immediately deploy it to grow users or visibility or clicks per day or whatever the important metric is. But there's a direct path that you can take this money and turn it into growth. However, most companies fall somewhere in the middle. It's not a obvious choice whether you should be going bootstrap or VC or angel investment. So let's break it down and look at some of the criteria which you should be considering when thinking about making this choice. But before we get onto that, I want to ask you for a favor, and I think you probably know what's coming. To make sure that you get informed each time new episodes come out, please remember to subscribe, ring that bell, and like this episode, because liking it tells the algorithm that founders like you are interested in this kind of content and will help surface more of this sort of information for you. If you'd like to get some of the boot one-on-one, -on -one, I encourage you to go to the website and sign up for the newsletter. I sound out a link in each email that allow you to get one-on-one -on -one coaching time with me for help with your business. Finally, I'd like to invite you to join the Feel the Boot Founders Alliance. It's a Facebook group full of other entrepreneurs like you who appreciate this kind of Feel the Boot content. It's a wonderful environment to get questions answered, get support, or bounce ideas off other founders. I hope we'll see you there. First, let's talk dilution. 
when you're taking in outside investors, they're going to end up owning some of your company. So if you bootstrap, you can hold on to much more of it. After you've incentivized a number of employees for a number of years, you might have given away, say, 40% of the company to your team, which means you still have, say, 60% for the founder or split between the founders. And that's a pretty nice chunk. With a VC, if you're going out for you know, pre-seed, seed, A, B, C, D rounds, you know, the valuations are getting bigger, the investments are getting bigger, you may be lucky with if the founding team ends up holding something like 25% or 10% of the company or less. Uh, but, of course, it is also a question of a big slice of a tiny pie versus potentially a fairly small slice of a gigantic pie. But understand that when you're going out and doing these rounds, particularly if you need many rounds of funding to achieve your objective, you're going to be diluting your ownership substantially. We all hope that our startups are going to be smash successes and that at seven years we're going to be a deck of corn and going public or having some amazing acquisition. But there's a real difference between how this works if you have a sort of more mediocre exit, say a double or a triple or even a single. Maybe you're, you're exiting at 10 to $50 million. If you bootstrapped, that can still be a life-altering outcome. Now, you could be walking away with 10 or $20 million personally as, as a result. And for most of us, that's going to be pretty life-altering. Whereas with a VC, if you go out at some maybe only a hundred million or a couple hundred million, but the valuations that you've been getting investments at are that or above, then the preferences will probably end up wiping you out and you might end up with very little to nothing at the end of the day, even though you were able to sell the company for a fair chunk of money. Now, I went through this myself. When I did my startup, I was convinced it was going to be a billion dollar company. And as it turns out, I was unable to get venture capitalists to back me. I actually did get a fair amount of angel money, but I was convinced it was going to be this giant thing. We ended up having a very nice exit and I took home a really good payday, but that's because I'd only taken a total of two and a half million dollars in investment. So I still had substantial ownership in the company and was able to then reap the rewards of a modest sized exit. One thing a lot of founders think about is independence. They don't necessarily want to have a bunch of investors looking over their shoulder and telling them how to run their business. Now, ownership percentages aren't everything. And I did early on a whole episode called the 51% delusion, sort of debunking the idea that as soon as you sell more than half the company, you have no control anymore. In fact, you still have a lot of control, but as soon as you start taking investment, those investors will start exerting a lot of force on the kinds of decisions you make, even if they don't have the technical voting rights to force you in certain directions, they still have many less direct ways of applying substantial pressure. And as they should, they've invested in your company and they have a right to have some say in how things go. However, I don't want to make it sound like that's a bad thing. In fact, having an outside board can be really useful. Uh, my board was wonderful because they asked the hard questions. They'd really put my feet to the fire and I couldn't just kind of hand wave over some half thought out piece of strategy. They were going to grill me and make sure that I had in fact worked it all the way through before giving their assent. And they became a brain trust for us and really did add quite a lot of value to the company. You should also think through how being resource constrained is going to affect your company and the way you want to manage it. In a bootstrapped environment, at least in most cases, you're extremely cash constrained. You know, you're trying to put every dollar back into growing the company and building out the next versions of the products, but you're never able to just hire the dream team and grow as fast as you want, at least not until you really hit some magical product market fit and achieve virality and explode. So you're going to be living lean. Whereas if you bring in VC, you potentially have huge coffers of cash. And in fact, they're expecting you to spend like crazy and grow. They're actually the challenge can be doing useful things with that money and not just being stupid and wasteful. Although frankly, the VCs sort of expect you to be kind of wasteful because they want you deploying as fast as, as you can. And they know it's not possible to do that in a perfectly efficient way. Another thing to think about is the resiliency of your business to different kinds of challenges that may come up. 
And I think that bootstrapped companies and VC-backed companies have some different characteristics while both being quite vulnerable. So on the bootstrap side, it's pretty straightforward. You are incredibly cash constrained. You're typically living hand to mouth on a continuous basis. And so anything that can interrupt the cash flow could be an existential threat to the company. Even small bumps in the road can be huge problems. I remember with Anonymizer, we probably spent 18 months with less than three weeks of working capital in the bank. Right? We were right on the ragged edge. And I recall once when our credit card company shut us off on a Friday night and pulled a bunch of money back out of, out of our checking account. And we had to scramble and do everything we could conceive of to keep the company alive through that. And frankly, there were many moments at which the survival of the company hung by a thread and it was just luck and tenacity that allowed us to get through. But VC comes with its own set of problems, right? They're expecting you to maintain this insane exponential growth rate. But what happens if you miss that? You start running into some problems, a new competitor emerges, you're having trouble going from the early adopters to the mainstream users. And so that curve starts to arc down. Well, you may not be able to get that next round of funding, right? The VCs might say, mm, no, I think we're going to step back and walk away from this deal. At which point you've got maybe thousands of employees, you're burning millions and millions of dollars. It can be almost impossible to pull out from that glide slope you're on, right? You've got, you're in a fighter jet pointed at the ground with the afterburners running, trying to pull up, trying to shed expenses as fast as you can. It can be impossible. And in fact, many of my competitors that were around in 2000 when the dot-com collapse happened were in exactly this situation. I knew other companies that were in the same space as me, but were VC backed. And they had somewhat similar revenues to mine, but expenses that were 10, 100 times what mine were. And they ended up just getting utterly destroyed because they couldn't cut back to be as lean as they needed to be and live within their means. Whereas we'd been living within our means the whole time. It wasn't fun, but we were basically able to walk through the dot-com collapse and just continue to bootstrap our way up. Another thing to think about is whether you need help with relationships and connections. Being in a bootstrapped business can be a pretty lonely situation. You know, you're there by yourself, you're trying to build the company, but really everything falls on your shoulders. It's all your responsibility. And unless you have a personally rich network, you may not be able to get the help that you really need. Now, you can ameliorate that to some degree by building a really robust advisory board and reaching out and networking as much as you possibly can. Really important things to do. But when you bring in investors, particularly at the venture capital level, they come with huge Rolodexes. They've got tons of connections, other companies that they've backed that they'll connect you with, other kinds of investors. They're probably on the boards of all sorts of companies and can help get you in the door at all these different places. Plus, just being backed by a big VC is a huge stamp of confidence which makes everything else easier. It's easier to bring in customers because they believe that you're established and will be around. It's easier to hire. It's easier to bring in more investors because investors like to follow other investors. So there's a big network effect from those investors and a trade-off part of what they're getting the equity for. Now, I've been using the terms VC and angel somewhat interchangeably in this talk, but really they are in different categories. So with angel investors, they're coming in very early at low valuation. So most angels like to invest, say $25,000 individually in a company that's at below a $10 million valuation, probably like five being the sweet spot. And they're willing to invest in a broad variety of companies. They still want their 20 to 50 times their money back, but they can get those sort of returns at somewhat reasonable exit valuations, right? They don't need you to be some decacorn to achieve the results that they need. Unlike the VCs who have now a fund and outside limited partner investors who are putting demands on them and driving their decision-making process. So you can in fact have a bit of a hybrid model, which is exactly what I did. I ended up bringing in a number of angel investments over many years, in total about two and a half million, but never took any venture capital. And so when we finally had our exit, even though it wasn't you know, something you read about in the New York Times, it was still enough to generate very good returns for all of those angel investors. 
So this isn't a binary choice. You do have some options here where you could go bootstrap until you hit a certain level of size, a certain level of traction, allows you to get the valuation you want because you've really proven out more success before you bring in that money. And at that point, maybe it's just angel investment and then you stop. Or you go the whole route and you go bootstrap to angel, to VC, to VC, to VC, to VC, and ramp it all the way up. You could also start with, by getting some outside investors to kickstart you, probably just angels, and then bootstrap from there. So that just gives you the seed you need to get the wheel rolling, after which you have revenues that you can then feed back into the business and grow organically. Now, once you get that venture capital though, you're kind of committed. So going from fully VC funded in an A, B, or C institutional round and then bootstrapping isn't really an option. Although at some point, if you've achieved scale and have meteoric growth out of your own activity, then I guess you could call it bootstrapping, but it's really just growing a big business. So some of the things that you're gonna be thinking about as you go through this decision-making process are, how defensible is this market? You know, do you need to take over the whole thing or can you cut out, carve out a niche and protect it because of patents or some other uh, protective mechanism? How mature is the market? Is this something that's gonna take a huge amount of cash to deploy to grow quickly? Does it take a huge amount of cash to get going at all? That is, you know, the lack of cash is your primary constraint in starting the business. Do you need to grow rapidly because it is a network effects business and first mover is gonna win? And how long is this window of opportunity out there, right? If it's a really short window of opportunity, you may need to jump and move quickly. Whereas if it's not, if this is sort of an existing uh, opportunity, you can then grow into it more gradually. And are there sharks swimming around? Or is this a really active field where there's tons of other people who see the same opportunity and everyone's kind of, you know, biting at the chum? Or is this sort of a less sexy area or an, or an opportunity that many people, particularly maybe in the technological hotbed areas, aren't really aware of? And so you can then take your time growing the business into that area and just growing from your own revenue and success. Even if you want to go for VC, it may not be an option for you. Even if you've gotten angel investment, that next hurdle is really high. Crunchbase data showed that out of 8,000 angel-backed companies, only 1,200 were able to go on to get institutional funding, get that A round, which means that 6,600 never got any more money, or at least not from institutionals. They might've been able to do more uh, angel rounds, but they didn't take that, cross that chasm. So even if this is a path that you think that you want to take, it doesn't necessarily mean it's one that you're going to be able to take. Fortunately, bootstrapping, angels, and VCs are not your only options. You've got a few other ways that you can generate the capital that you need to build your business. And one of those is working with strategic investors. So this would be established businesses that have an interest in your company. Either they want to use what you're building internally, or they see it as a tool that they can leverage. It's, it's a th thing that they want to exist, and they may be willing to fund that. They may be investors in the conventional sense, but with very different criteria, right? They're, there's not a fund that they're looking to return. They don't care about, in fact, your exit valuation so much as they care about what having your solution exist will do for them. They'll probably want to make sure you prioritize building out the features and capabilities that they want, but it can be a really good approach. And finally, you can look at getting debt. There's venture debt that's out there. Uh, banks will loan, but also often angel investors and other investment type vehicles will invest in companies through debt. And that debt typically needs to be secured in some way. So it can be secured with the assets of the business. It could be a personal loan that you're guaranteeing uh, if it's small. Uh, it could be against receivables. So if you've got some big customer that owes you a check or you know, is gonna pay you monthly over the next year, you might be able to get someone to loan you the money against that now and you'll pay them back out of the recurring revenues you're gonna get for them. Or uh, working capital loans. So they're gonna loan you the money to build a bunch of widgets that you're then going to sell and pay them back out of that. And they're secured typically by that inventory. And then many states, many cities have programs set up for founders where you can get a loan of say $50,000 that's very high risk because they're trying to build the entrepreneurial ecosystem in that area. So it's worth researching it, where those are available because as that first level of seed, maybe after your friends and family round, that can be a great way to get enough cash 
to be able to show the traction that you'd need to get the next level of investors, the angel investors, the pre-seed funds interested in your company. Thanks for watching this episode of Feel the Boot. I hope you found it useful and interesting. And if so, please like, subscribe, ring that bell, and come join Feel the Boot. Come up to the website, join the mailing list, and that will give you access to one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. I send that out with every email we send. It's really low volume. It's typically no more than twice a month. Uh, also join the other founders at the Feel the Boot Founders Alliance over at Facebook. Great group of people, active discussions. I think you'll find it really useful. I hope to see you next time. Till then, ciao.